I'm Cool Deep. And I'm Peter. This is the Root Motive Podcast. All opinions expressed are those of the hosts and do not necessarily reflect the position of any other organizations or affiliations. Any medically relevant information is not substitute for professional medical advice. Always consult with your healthcare professionals before implementing any advice given on this podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Root Motive Podcast. This is episode three. Hello. Yeah, I'm Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, what you been up to, man? Um, not too much. Just grinding with school. Two weeks left in the semester, uh, finishing up. Just f- continuing to work on classes. Took an exam this week, writing papers. Um, finished the 30-page review paper on... Uh, the topic I was writing on for an independent project. Damn. And um, yeah, just trying to get some fresh air, stay outside, and it's about it. That's what's up. That's what's up. I'll tell you, man, I do not miss finals week at university. Dude, it was the worst. The amount of stress to have like four exams that are all worth 20 to 30% of your final grade is ridiculous. I, I like projects, though, because you could kind of manage your time outside of the classroom with that and group projects were good too yeah i feel like the exam format is just a i don't know it's a silly notion now it's i think it's just continued on from like before tech before tech was around and then now obviously everything's at our disposal and i feel like we mm-hmm. shouldn't have to cram for i think project-based learning is way better because it's more gradual you're interactive you're hands-on and you're actually getting more i think you're learning better and it stays with you longer probably so yeah you excited to be done with those exams though I really only have two, and then the other two I'm taking are, are other classes are just project or writing or writing assignments. Mm-hmm. So it's not that bad. Uh, plus, cool, everything's cool. open note right now, so I mean, it's it can't be that bad. That's fair. I I always found that open note was harder because they expect you to because yeah. you have everything at your disposal. They just make everything harder for you. Yeah. No, that's true. I still prefer open note, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. Um. That's good. I'm chilling. I what did I do today? I watched TV. I've been playing Warzone with the boys. You know, always winning, stay winning. I'm actually terrible, but that's fine. I'm learning. <laughs> um, I think yeah, Peter remembers. That was a terrible shot in Modern Warfare Two. Yeah, you just didn't play video games much. That was the problem. <laughs> this weekend, actually, a couple of new things came out on Netflix. Ricky Gervais' new show, Afterlife. Well, the first season came out last year, but. The second season came out yesterday, so I'm in the middle of that. It's really good. First season was really good. It makes you kind of think about, you know, how you're living your life, why you miss people and like what, you know, good things you can do. Uh, Another movie, Chris Hemsworth movie, Extraction, it was dope. So they filmed it in actually the my home, my home city in India, Ahmedabad, and they filmed some parts in Bangladesh. And so he's, you know, just doing an extraction of this drug lord's kid who was kidnapped and it was pretty sick the director sam hargrave he was a stunt coordinator in avengers endgame and he was the stunt person for captain america throughout like civil war and some of the other films that um the russo brothers did so the movie's really cool check it out it's just action the guy knows what he's doing so i really enjoyed that i think i'm gonna watch that actually it's pretty it's it's cool to see like you know everybody speaking hindi all the Indian people are speaking Hindi. Not all people in that region speak the same language. So it was pretty cool to see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I'd suggest watch it. What else have I watched? Oh, Dave on FX is really good. Lil Dicky, that's his rapper name. He has his own show. It's hilarious. Definitely watch that. Check that out. Yeah, I heard about that. What else have I seen? I've been watching, you know, Superstore, Single Parents, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, just ended its season that was a pretty good episode what's that about brooklyn 99 it's got andy samberg from the lonely island and it's a comedy about cops at the 99th precinct in new york city it's hilarious you gotta watch it all right oh yeah i think that's about it for movies and tv that i've been watching succession you kept telling me about that one right yeah yeah succession so i watched that uh, a couple weeks ago a bunch of crazy rich people doing crazy rich people things it's awesome. It makes you feel like you're right there. So definitely watch that. It's on HBO. But for some reason, there's some HBO shows on Hulu. So I was watching it on that. Nice. But definitely, I, I think, Peter, you'd like Succession. You'd find it interesting. Yeah, maybe. 
I just like action movies mainly, and like just well, anything that's well made, I guess, mm-hmm. and has a plot. That's fair. I don't know. That's fair. Not as much of a TV series guy, personally. Yeah. The thing we wanted to launch off of for this episode was just kind of food and cooking and kind of keep that theme going because I'm on my own. I have to get my own food and I kind of 50%, I'm not even 50%, 40% cook my own food. 60% I'll like get frozen food from the supermarket and heat it up. And then some of the, most of the other time I'll just get takeout. Like I love eating out of Taco Bell, Domino's, cheap fast food. It's that's, that's just my diet. But since the whole quarantine thing, I haven't really been eating out as much because I don't really know where other people's hands have been when they're making my food. And that's fine. They can keep doing their thing. I just don't trust it necessarily. I've been making my own food. I usually keep things super simple. I use mainly beans or like other legumes, pulses. That's how I get my protein. And then vegetables, I'll get frozen veggie packets different types you can get stir fry or like california style whatever and then for carbs i'll just get like rice or frozen naans from the indian grocery my mom bought me an instant pot when she was here and the instant pot's really sick you can make rice in like 15 minutes you don't have to do anything you just put a little bit of water rice butter salt in the thing and then yeah it's all done for you peter have you have you ever had an instant pot to cook with no, my apartment mate did, or person who lived in the same apartment with me, had a, like a rice cooker and it worked really well. And he was always, he basically mm-hmm. ate rice every night, <laughs> rice and chicken. Yeah. It's so good for other stuff too. Like you can make da, like you can have all your lentils and like you can mix the spices in. It tastes amazing when you make yeah. it that. Yeah, it's cool. I've always been really reluctant to learn how to cook. It, I just feel like it's not a good use of my time, but... I've just kind of had to since I've been home. I can't just eat frozen food all the time. So I've just been trying new things. Last night, I made enchiladas. So the other day, I cut up some chilies, some green bell pepper, some onion, garlic, and then I sauteed it, add beans, and then I used that for the stuffing inside the tortillas, and then I put a little bit of cheese on it and then put it back on the stove, cooked it, put sauce over it, put cheese over it. And it was actually really good. I got to give myself props. I'm not a good cook at all, but it tasted amazing. That's good. Wait, so where are you getting your food? Are you ordering online? Are you set, are you going to the grocery store mostly? I've been getting groceries delivered. There's like a Safeway in the area, so they use Instacart. It's pretty good. I mean, it's expensive, but like I've been saving money on gas. I haven't been driving anywhere, going anywhere. So I figured just that's just how it balances out. Yeah, that's true. Some places do curbside, like the Indian grocery store, they do curbside pickup, which was fine. They're like a local thing, so they don't really have the delivery stuff all figured out, I think. Yeah, but that that's in Arizona. Peter, what is, a, what is the grocery situation over in New Hampshire like? My parents say that they, they've been having a hard time getting stuff delivered. I, yeah, I can't find anything. I know that some friends said that BJ's delivers for like 15 bucks if you order from them, but I was told that Shaw's and like, other places like Market Basket, it was really hard to find delivery from there. Yeah, all the main main ch- main chain grocery stores here, like Shaw's, Market Basket, Hannaford, and those are really the main ones. Trader Joe's doesn't do- deliver, but yeah, they're all kind of booked on. They're booked out on the deliveries. Like every time you try, to, they basically are only booked out a couple days, or at least I just mainly try to go through Hannaford. It's like they're booked mm-hmm. out a couple days, and they don't allow for, for future bookings like at past a week out or past more than two days. Oh damn! So it's a little bit like hard because you have to like jump on it and i'm just kind of lazy i don't mind going in to be honest i just Mm -hmm. wear a mask and go at a quiet hour like morning or evening i try to go and it's pretty quiet and i don't know (laughs) that's what i that's what i'll do and i'll go like once a week like do you wear your mask when you go to the grocery store i just put it on like when i'm walking in i don't even wear it when i'm driving people are wearing it when they're driving Mm -hmm. wearing masks when they're walking i think it's kind of ridiculous personally but (laughs) That's just me. Because, like, if you're outside and you're breathing, I mean, you're in a huge, like, thousand upon thousand, or just an immense bubble of air that's not going to, like, you're not going to contaminate the air by breathing in it outside. And then if you're, like, in in your car, I mean, I don't, unless you're having people come in and out of your car, but... Hey, man, I'm no scientist, so I I wouldn't be able to tell you what works, what doesn't. (laughs) Yeah. No, I don't know. I'm just, just at first glance, it's kind of... But yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, and I, I wear the mask in the store. 
But yeah, in terms of cooking, do you, I mean, like my mom, she always made Indian food for me. It was always really good. She always made different types of curries with like okra, green beans, potatoes, spinach, all the different types of vegetables you can find. And then she would also make other beans, like lentils, lentil dishes, dal and whatnot. Yeah. So I was, I was really lucky to have my mom cook me really good Indian food when I was living in a home, but like. On my own again, I don't. I don't really cook. I mean, my friend. I know a couple of my friends that love to cook on their own. I don't know how they do it. Find the energy for that. But do you? Well, I think do there's you something cook- to be said out of cooking. Like I like to make my own food, and like I keep things simple. But I mean, I just mm-hmm. basically eat, like meats and vegetables and some nuts and seeds, peanut butter. Because with type one diabetes, and then I've had SIBO, which is mm-hmm. a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and it's basically just a dysbiotic habitat of bacteria in my gut that aren't or that's not that's causing issues like with i had bloating and gas and digestion like a year ago when i was a junior in college and Mm -hmm. um it wasn't really that bad the symptoms weren't that bad but my blood sugar was the biggest was the biggest red flag because it was bouncing Mm -hmm. all over the place and i would walk from class to class and it would drop like 50 points just walking across a hallway like it, it got to a point where it was it was it mean it was unbearable and like i kept trying to get diagnosed and no one knew what was going on and blood tests were all normal so that was kind of when i changed my diet up because before i had eaten um basically just a normal american diet although i'd started kind of eating health i got in don't kind of cut out dairy after i graduated high school so i would just eat like yeah. sandwiches with turkey, peppers, spinach, lettuce, mayonnaise, whole grain bread, typically stuff like that. And at college, I kind of would just eat any sandwich I could get. And then just, I ate a lot of English muffins for a while with peanut butter. That was my staple. I basically just eat tons of peanut butter every morning. Like I, that's, I I can go through a jar. I would used to go through a jar and a 28 ounce jar, I think in like four or five days or maybe a week. I don't know. Or five days. It's crazy. And then I still eat a lot of peanut butter. But yeah, and then... Do you ever miss putting like butter on your English muffins and just having it toasted just lightly enough where the bread is kind of red on top and it's just a little bit crispy, but the inside's still soft? Well, I don't even eat English muffins anymore, dude. But I'm just saying like, yeah, like I was do you doing miss that, that though? Do you miss those English muffins? Yeah, kind of. I like English muffins. Yeah. Oh, so good, dude. But... So good. <laughs> I'm fine without it. So yeah, and then dinners, I would just eat like typical stuff. I eat probably the, just the most meat and potatoes. Diet. Or I like to have potatoes, meat, steak, fish, chicken, mm-hmm. beef, other beef, pork, roast beef, um, stuff like that. And um, carrots and broccoli as like basic vegetables. Yeah, I, I eat basic, pretty basic. And then yeah, once I got SIBO, I basically cut out all carbs. So um, Or all like main starchy forms of carbs, all breads, pasta, mm-hmm. dairy products. I had already been kind of cutting it out, but yeah, I stopped completely drinking milk, like any cheese, even ice cream. Yeah, I don't have artificial sweeteners. I do have chocolate, and that's about the only thing I have that's like a treat. But other than that, I just eat like eggs in the morning. Mm-hmm. I eat like tuna, fit, canned fish a lot, uh, nuts and seeds, a lot of salads. I do like do make. I'm trying. To, I'm starting to get into making shakes actually, like blueberries, bananas celery mm-hmm. and stuff like that and um th- that's actually it's really easy to digest for anybody so I, you feel like you're getting like a bo- you feel like you're bo- getting like a boost drink or something I, I don't know you feel like you're getting an energy shot or something yeah like that. and it's like a natural energy shot like i think these are already getting popular but yeah like fruit smoothies are and fruit and vegetable smoothies are i don't know i like them. out of curiosity so i mean just to preface for the listeners i'm vegetarian so that's why i eat like yeah. beans so i don't eat meat or anything so peter if you with your health stuff would you even be able to be a vegetarian like with the SIBO stuff like does your diet basically say you have to eat meat to get these nutrients and whatnot in order for your body to process it no i mean SIBO is not a very well understood illness so a lot of it's just been my mm-hmm. own like research and like just self self experimentation on what works and what doesn't for me so like for mm-hmm. me, I need to just eat high protein, high fat diet. Like if I didn't eat meat, there's no way I, personally I could handle it. But yeah, SIBO doesn't mean you can't. I mean, anyone can go vegetarian. It sometimes it doesn't agree with a lot of people. And like for me, mm-hmm. I think I'm. 
I don't know. I my gut is probably so inefficient at processing stuff at like breaking down food. Mm-hmm. I feel like I have to eat like pretty s- consistently. I can't really skip that many meals, or else I don't feel that great. I can actually, but um, I just have to make sure I eat like very well, or else I don't feel that great. So I mean, vegetarian would probably it would be a disaster. Like I don't even go ketogenic technically because that doesn't agree with me either. Although it does significantly reduce the amount of insulin I need. But I'm just so skinny as it is, and I don't know if it's good for my body to be burning ketones. So basically, like, if you eat a ketone diet, which I basically eat, I eat a, I'd say I eat a low carb diet. So I don't, I'm not actually into the weeds with exactly metabolically what's the going on when you're eating low carb versus ketogenic versus, or low carb versus ketogenic is like kind of a light distinction because I, if you eat a certain amount of carbs that are low, but not enough to get your body to burn fat as energy instead of glucose. That's basically where the line draws, I think, between a ketogenic diet and a low carb diet. So I'm getting off topic, but yeah. No, it's fine. I've heard a lot of things about keto. I'm not anyone to make any claims about it, but I've heard good things and bad things. So I don't know. Well, the thing is, is like, I think it does help you burn fat because it reduces the amount of insulin you need through just not mm-hmm. eating carbs on that basis. And like insulin is not just involved in getting sugar into your cell. It's, it actually is involved. I mean, it's a, it's a metabolic hormone. So like with the more insulin you secrete, the more you're telling your body to store fat mm-hmm. and synthesize, um, glycogen. So you're basically, it's a storage molecule. So that's how you build muscle. You build fat, but for people who are already overweight, you don't really want to be. Yeah. That's why the problem with type two diabetes in the first place is, um, just overuse of insulin and uh, or over secretion of insulin and you're cause you're signaling your body to just store stuff so when you go ketogenic you're like really completely changing the way your body burns and you start burning fat instead of glucose mm-hmm. which requires insulin and so you reduce the amount of insulin you need because you don't need as much or because you're not consuming glucose so you burn fat for me i find that like a ketogenic diet doesn't work Cause I'm 145 pounds, six foot two. I'm like a stick and, uh, Damn. <laughs> so yeah, I'm like already on the cusp of being underweight. And, uh, yeah, I find that when I go, I had to go ketogenic actually, like to even to test for SIBO, you have to follow a very strict diet because you need to be making sure that you're not feeding the bacteria that might be feeding on the carbohydrates and that basically grow excessively in your small intestine. So yeah, when I would do that, my insulin requirements would just shoot way down. I would need like almost no insulin. and mm-hmm. um, But I just would feel terrible. And that's probably because it takes a little while to get adjusted to running a ketogenic diet. But I just don't think it would work for me because of my body weight, notably. So I just mm-hmm. kind of go low carb and eat like the peanut butter. I eat a, a lot of peanut butter. So it ends up being a decent carb source. I eat a lot of seeds, which are pretty low, but that ends up being a decent source. And then like bananas, carrots, blueberries. So basically like natural fruits and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and vegetable and some vegetables that have carbs, but no potatoes or anything like that even. So basically it's a FODMAP diet. It's like, it's called a low FODMAP diet. So it's non-fermentable foods are allowed. Interesting. Yeah. I should have said that before, but yeah, that's kind of the, it's a SIBO diet. It's a, it's a hard diet for people to follow a lot of times because it's so restrictive, but for me, it also helps regulate my blood sugar. And like, I, I've never been that addicted or d- addicted to food or have eating problems so like i'm very oh, okay I'm, I'm, you no, i'm just talking generally no no i'm talking generally <laughs> no i'm just talking in general so yeah for me i'm able to stay pretty disciplined with it it's kind of an easy thing and so it just i thought overall it was a good right yeah i mean it's just good to kind of get some context of like how does your body's different issues dictate your diet and like what you make and what you eat it's interesting because like i, I know I had a coworker once whose kid, she couldn't process like, I forget what it was. She couldn't process meat proteins or something like that. So they were make. I, really? I had mentioned something about me being vegetarian. And then he said that his kid was like, couldn't process proteins or something. So then like meat proteins. So then she had to go vegetarian. I think that's what really? it was, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. And then I had another friend literally couldn't. Okay. So vegan first of all all of the different things in animals would cause her stomach to be upset and then the acidity from tomatoes and citrus and stuff like that would upset her as well and then 
Yeah, so no dairy and then like barely any bread and stuff. So she basically living on lettuce. It was ridiculous. Wow. Basically lettuce and other green stuff because the diet, cause her body literally couldn't handle any anything else. Wow, that's really. It was like a compounded stuff going on. It was weird. No, the microbiome is such a big topic that's not like, or that's coming to light now. And like, it's mm-hmm. so poorly understood because it's so complex and there's so many different species living down there. I've been kind of getting involved for my own purposes, like in looking at, I want to get my own microbiome sampling done so I can kind of do more targeted treatment for what I have. Cause I don't even, you really didn't get know. that done. Well, I had a SIBO test done. So like I basically, all they do is measure methane and hydrogen gas levels that your body's producing. So what the test does is you fast for two days. You, you don't eat certain foods that are fermentable or it's very strict, like super strict. You can't eat like anything but like meats basically and vegetables that are non-fermentable. So it's just entirely non-fermentable. It's extremely strict. And then you go and take the test and you drink a lactose solution that's meant to like basically be broken down by the bacteria that see, that are in, implicated in SIBO. And then they produce hydrogen and methane gas. And then usually you have one or the other, either one of the other types. It's hydrogen dominant or methane dominant SIBO. So these mm-hmm. bacteria produce hydrogen and methane as byproducts of like their their, meta, their metabolism. So yeah, I, I was like semi positive even after following this diet and following specific like taking antibiotics for a, for a two week for a two week round. And like eight months later, I still tested some partially positive after following mm-hmm. the diet. So like I don't. So technically it still hasn't gone away. So I'm actually going to look into doing another round of treatment with another type of antibiotic. I just haven't done it yet because of the whole crisis going on. And like they yeah, can, no, your, they can co- increase your risk of sepsis. So I didn't want to touch these antibiotics. I didn't, I didn't know about sepsis until the other day. I saw a LinkedIn post about this dude who was perfectly healthy. He got Corona and then he got sepsis while in the hospital. And I didn't know that it was something that happened while you were at the hospital and like not something that really happens outside of there yeah it can happen from like a lot of different things yeah you t- you mentioned that last episode i think did i oh my be no it's good <laughs> no so yeah basically my circling back around like the microbiome's a poorly understood thing and like it's causing so many weird dietary like restrictions in people and weird food reactions and intolerances and like it's not actually being like you're not your body's not actually allergic to it but it's not you're not you're body for whatever reason is not tolerating it well so it's kind of a step before mm-hmm. now a full allergic reaction and i mean i think it's related to just probably dysbiotic guts and like i've been looking into the weeds about how air pollution can affect your mm-hmm. the quality yeah. of your microbiome and like potentially like certain non-native emfs and stuff and a lot of our environmental influences can be Oh, 100%. I feel like people in general severely underestimate how much your environment affects you and whatnot. Like yeah. with the whole epigenetics, like when I first learned about epigenetics, it changed my whole perspective on stuff. The environment literally defines your DNA and then you pass that on. Yeah. And like, yeah, I, I have zero doubt that stuff like the air quality would affect your micro. Like your body's so sensitive to this stuff. People like to think of themselves as very tough. Like humans are so tough. We can withstand anything, but we're really affected in a lot of ways by the small things. Yeah, I, for sure. I think that we're, there's so much subconsciously that our bodies, like the amount of things that we're, our body's carrying out right now is like in the trillions or, or orders of magnitude beyond what we're even aware, able to comprehend. And yeah. yet I don't think we like, it's like we, pre, like we think, or we diagnose our environment as like being safe or being capable like we're usually able to like think like okay we're in a safe environment i'm not feeling too bad right now and like we're not really aware of what our environments are doing to us because a lot of it we think we have a grasp on what our body's doing but we really have no idea and like i feel like subtle things that affect over our bodies over long periods like air pollution and like subtle problems in our environment can just cause stress over the long term mm-hmm. so and that could be affecting our I mean, I think that's what's causing so many of like the type two problem, like the type two ob- diabetes epidemic, is partially caused by like the insulin resistance from just the chronic stress, like environmental stress, like not just psychological stress. Like I think a lot yeah. of it's outside of people's control, and it's I mean a lot of it is within their control, but some of the factors are like if you're living in a city. I saw a yeah, study about how if you're living in a that. city, like you're literally have a higher risk of heart attack, stroke 
bad cholesterol. I mean, simple stuff like that. Major risk factors for all sorts of things. You have higher, you have worse profiles on the on those things if you live in a city. So yeah, absolutely. All right, I think that's about it in terms of time we have for today. So we're getting used to the whole podcast thing. You know, give us a couple episodes to figure stuff out. Like I said, the food was a launch pad, and then we got into diets and then we went into epigenetics and stuff so whatever our launch pad is isn't necessarily what we'll end up talking about the whole time we are very open to suggestions though we want to talk about what listeners want to hear so if you guys have any suggestions please let us know you can email us you can comment on instagram and twitter i think i'm gonna make a facebook for this as well but yeah, just let us know. We're more than happy to talk. And, and if you have any other specific questions about Peter's health stuff or like anything from, you know, like he lives in New Hampshire. I live in Arizona now. So like anything about that, just leave a comment. Let us know. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you guys at the next episode. Yeah. Take care. Stay safe out there.